Hello and welcome to Mathematical Discovery, Math 310. In the next hour I'm going to give you an overview of the course, what is expected, what our goals are, and how to be successful. I think the best place to start is to talk about what mathematical discovery is. I think the easiest way to characterize it is that we will be doing math from start to finish, from the ground up. Another way of thinking of this course is that it is math for teachers, so people going into elementary school teaching. The significant difference, the single biggest difference between this course and every other math class that we teach at American River College is that it is inductive. Inductive reasoning is when you find patterns by looking at examples. So we'll look at a lot of examples and then we'll tease out a pattern from those. Now that means that I will not be giving you the rule. In fact, our goal is to find a rule, something that applies to all of these examples. And to do that, I'm going to be using the Socratic method. That simply means to teach by asking questions. Now for this to work, you're going to need time to think, to reflect, and then when we complete this process of inductive reasoning to have learned how that topic works. So time means that each of our attendance assessments will be open for two weeks. And what that means is over that two week time period you can go in and you can work for a little bit, you can answer some questions, and then you can go out and you can think about those. When you return you'll have been able to reflect on what you've learned so far. A big part of this course is to enjoy mathematics, to do mathematics differently, to do mathematics the way it is done by a mathematician, to explore a problem, to make a guess about how that problem is solved in general, to check it out, to apply it to other cases. And of course, as future teachers, I do hope that you're able to impart that joy of mathematics to your own students. So again, welcome. Um, this is Frances. So she is um, here uh, seen in her adoption photo from Tehama County Animal Services. And so she is my um, companion through um, this online adventure. So the next thing I want to talk about is that this is not Math 300. This is not Math Ideas. So just to compare and contrast the two, Math Ideas, Math 300 has a text, it has videos, all sorts of stuff. Math 310 does not, for the obvious reason that the goal is to look for patterns. So I will not be giving you rules. You're not going to get a rule and then apply it. And by extension, that means that there is no telling in a sense of being told what to do next. Another difference between math ideas and math discovery is the topics. In math ideas, topics are chosen as a capstone, the last ideas that you need to be successful as a citizen. Things like mortgages, things like apportionment, uh, fair division. In math discovery, we choose topics that develop a deep understanding of the elementary school mathematical curriculum. Things like calculus only exist because of topics that you first see in elementary school mathematics. If we could divide by zero, and every elementary school kid will tell you we can't, but if we could we would not need calculus. To an extent that little headwater of not being able to divide by zero leads to all of calculus. So topics are chosen for a different reason and we come at those results differently. In math discovery we come at it from the point of view of examples and from those examples using the inductive method to state results. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I started at American River College. I have a bachelor's in mathematics from CSU Sac uh, Sacramento 
and a master's also in mathematics from UC Davis. My area is combinatorics. You can see in this picture on the right, a 1970s supercomputer. Um, it's also set up to allow it to be used as a settee as well. In the middle, behind the clear plastic, you can see what looks like a kind of blue mist. That is a sea of blue wires. The idea behind this early supercomputer was that each pair of components was connected with the exact same length of wire. So whether two components were close together or far apart, they had to have the same amount of wire connecting them. So that accounts for that sea of blue wire in there. And that's because this supercomputer did not have a clock. Clocks generally slow down computers by forcing them to do one task after a certain interval before doing the next. This supercomputer could work at the speed at which an electron could flow through that blue wire. Clocks also keep computers from overheating, and that's why we've got them still. But the idea here is that there's different ways of looking at designing things like computers and my interest in transit networks, bus routes, and optimizing those to serve more people better. In a professional capacity, I've been on the faculty senate, evaluation committees, the equity committee, I've hired a bunch of folks. I've also created a lot of educational resources. So in my open math, I've coded homework for four courses. I've written texts, open source texts, for th uh, three courses. Also wrote curriculum that allows us to teach classes here at American River College, um, including the curriculum for this course. Um, a little bit more about my career in a teaching context. I have a master's in the art of teaching from UC Davis um, under Evelyn Sylvia. She was my advisor. At CSUS, I actually knew Elaine Casamatis, and I took an individualized study um, graph theory class from her. She is the professor at CSUS who created this course there. So what we teach is modeled and follows on her work. I graduated summa cum laude at both CSUS and UCD, and as part of the MAT program, I taught at Markham Elementary in Vacaville. And when I was there, this was the uh, mural that greeted kids and, and students and faculty when we showed up to Markham. I always loved that. The, everyone seems so happy, and there's the kid holding the plane, which is kind of appropriate for the Vacaville and Fairfield area and taking care of the planet. So I'm going to talk a lot about how to be successful this semester and, and what each part of the course is intended to um, provide. But I'd like to start with a challenge just to illustrate the idea of thinking about something. So our first challenge is this. The brother of the chief executive officer, the CEO of a major industrial firm, died. The man who died had no brother. How is this possible? So be thinking about that as we work through this. When I ask this question in a class of 30 or 40 people, I usually get four or five hands when I say, raise a hand if you think you know the answer to this. So don't be alarmed if you don't uh, immediately see an answer to this question. It does require some thought to get um, past some initial prejudices that are built into uh, the way I've asked this question, kind of directing your mind in one place. So the major part of this course is the attendance assessments. I've, I've already mentioned these. These are open for two weeks. This is where we're going to be doing the, the bulk of our learning using the inductive um, thinking method. So this will definitely require thought, reflection, and a willingness to discover. And I can't emphasize that too much. This will take time. So when it opens, Make sure you go in, get started, see what the topic's about, see how far you can get before you need some time to reflect on what's going on. And as you're doing that, be willing to discover new mathematics. The topics that I've chosen are not in the rest of the curriculum. They're not in other courses. So the idea here is not that you already know the answer and that you're trying to apply it to these examples. 
The idea here is that these examples are leading you to new mathematics. And really, in a word, that is creativity. That is creating something new. Math is essentially a creative activity, creating math by looking at patterns. Each part is graded. And of course, essays are graded uh, manually by me. Sometimes it takes me up to a week to get through um, grading all those free response parts of the attendance assessments. Now, each one is broken into several parts. The first is inductive. So of course, that will be taught using the Socratic method. So you're going to see a lot of questions. The idea here is for you to learn that mathematics by finding patterns. So patterns are essentially conjectures. They're things that work for what you've seen so far. Now, all this is exploration and discovery. You are working through patterns. A conjecture is essentially a good guess. Now, at this point in the semester, when you're working through something the first time, there'll be a low point value. Basically, every single question is worth one point. So later on, things will be worth more when we actually uh, return to these topics. So they, they're valuable in the sense that you're learning the mathematics, that you're learning how to learn in an inductive setting. And because there's so many parts and so many questions, this does contribute a lot to your grade. One of the other things we're going to do in the inductive part is to generalize a previous result. We'll talk about more that about a little bit later. The next part is the derivation. This is basically just a period to kind of regroup to summarize the process of finding a result. How did we get where we ended up? Um, we will gauge the strength of our conviction in the result. Many questions for some weeks don't end there. We'll return to that same topic during the remainder of the semester. So at that point, we may not have seen enough examples to be convinced of our result yet. We may need to see some more. Or we may not have yet encountered as a class uh, counterexamples, things that make our pattern fail. So we're basically just seeing how firm we feel our results are. We'll then see if we can generalize the process. Now, generalize means that we take a result or a process from one setting to another. So we're basically asking the question, does this process work in other settings? Are there other questions that we can answer with it? And then, of course, if we've got results, let's state them explicitly so that we can use them. And that's the next step, deductive. Most math classes, all other math classes, are deductive in the sense that we've got a result and we're using it to work through some examples. The deductive part of the semester, even in Math 310, is opposite in terms of order from the inductive part of the semester. And what I mean by that is, in the inductive part, we look at examples and form a general conclusion. In the deductive part, we apply that general conclusion to further examples. We may put it in a different setting and call it a different application. We may mention some vocabulary, some historical references. We may even be able to get a rule out of it and say, you know, this result is so strong and is so useful that we're going to call it a rule. That's how rules and formulas are made in mathematics. And for a few uh, results, mainly in number theory, we're going to um, get uh, some proofs as well. So two notes here. First off, generalizing a previous result is a very powerful use of induction. So this is when we take a known result and attempt to apply it in a new context. So I think you can all convince yourselves that when we multiply a positive times a negative, we're simply adding that negative to itself a repeated number of times. So you can think of multiplication as repeated addition. So if someone asks, and your students certainly will, why is a negative times a negative a positive? The answer is basically that we defined it to be that way so that we could use all of our results from 
positive numbers and generalize those results to negative numbers. In other words, what we knew worked for one group of numbers, we want to work for the negatives as well. So we define a negative times a negative to be a positive. Generalizing results is how, one of the ways that mathematics grows. Also, if you look up the word induction um, in the context of inductive thinking, you may come across results about proofs by induction, and those are very different things. A proof by induction is basically a proof that says that if you can uh, prove it for uh, a small number and you can get to the next one, then you can generalize that to all the larger integers. That is very different. In fact, that is deductive. It's a proof um, from inductive thinking. So if, if you look into this, make sure that you do not confuse a proof by induction with inductive thinking. Inductive thinking looks at examples trying to find patterns. One of the things that I do in Math 310 and I've had tremendous success with and I really like, and I'm continuing to do this semester, is allowing students on their own and in their own words um, to post to the entire class in the class notes a summary of what they've done, what worked for them, kind of that, that middle section, the derivation section, the idea of being able to share that with folks. And of course, there's extra credit for that as well. There's also forums. Each of the attendance assessments has a forum. And of course, there's extra credit, credit if you can um, use the Socratic method to help out uh, your classmates. If you go in and see a question, and you can lead them to an answer with your own questions. And of course, that's an important part of why we need two weeks to work through these. Things may be very difficult to understand at the beginning of that period, but over the course of two weeks, you can talk to other folks, you can post on the forums, and you can read other people's questions and answers. There's extra credit if you answer it yourself. Now, one of the things that I love about this course is implicit in it is what is mathematics? What does mathematics do? Why do we do it? Why does it work? And I'm going to use documentaries this semester to do that. I've got four major topics that I want to address with our documentaries. So the first is just the history of mathematics. Where did it come from? Who was doing it? As an elementary school teacher, I think it's important to know the answer to this. Some of our earliest evidence for people doing mathematics comes from, not unsurprisingly, Africa, because of course that's where our species comes from. And that's discussed in the story of one all the way up through the um, computer era. I use the story of maths and the code in my other uh, courses, but I think for an elementary school kind of level, the story of one is fun. Um, it's not particularly sophisticated. All of the um, uh, history that it presents is true, and I think it does it in a good way. We get a little bit more um, serious in our next pair of documentaries, The Joy of Winning by Hannah Fry about game theory. Game theory allows us to ask questions about strategy, about situations in which both parties can come out ahead. And then, of course, in terms of survival, um, talking about climate by numbers from the BBC. Math also deals with uncertainty, prediction, probability. And we're going to look at a NOVA documentary prediction by the numbers for that. And finally, we're going to end the semester with some really deep thoughts about what mathematics is, the philosophy of mathematics, again with Hannah Fry. And, you know, I don't particularly think magic numbers is the best name for documentary. But when you see it, I think you'll agree that it is very sophisticated and a high-level discussion about what math is, why it works, how it evolved, and where it can take us. So I, I, I really like ending the uh, semester with her three-part documentary, Magic Numbers. Documentaries do many other things for us as well. Of course, they emulate the Socratic method by asking, how do we know this? They demonstrate that there's many ways to teach mathematics. Um, they're similar to the best teacher in services, and they're used for education throughout the world. In Canada, science is taught with uh, documentaries. 
And of course, it prevents, uh, presents a diversity of genders and ethnicity. To me, understanding why math works and its power and utility in today's world and in history is a fascinating question. It also answers the question that you may ask that why a student would become interested in mathematics. What do, what would a student see in mathematics that would draw them towards the discipline? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we can see mathematics as one of the most human of pursuits, very similar to art and poetry and what it does, and what it's trying to accomplish. So those documentaries, I encourage you to watch each documentary three times. Many of my students watch it more than that. First time, just watch it with friends or family. It's always interesting for them to know what you're up to this semester. And it's also just a good way to learn what it is about. It's easy enough for me to say that something is about probability or the history of mathematics. But if you haven't been exposed to that before, just give yourself one viewing uh, that first time through to learn what it's about. The second time through, watch it with the subtitles turned on, pausing to take notes. You're going to be tested on all of these. So make sure that those notes are correct. Go through it a third time. Check your notes against what you see. Make sure you've got everything. Again, pause if you need to correct anything. You'll have two attempts on each documentary exam. The first one is timed. 10 minutes, uh, 10 questions in 20 minutes, and the second one is not timed. I have a huge uh, selection of questions that I've written for each documentary, so they're unlikely to be any of the same questions. And then uh, for each of these documentaries, you'll get two exams. You'll also get uh, uh, exams for each of the documentaries, and all of that will be averaged. So let's um, think about a interesting situation in elementary school mathematics. I have seen the example that I'm about to show you in every single text that attempts to introduce fractions. So when you are a teacher and you've got a math book and you're going into class and you open it to that first discussion of fractions, there's a very good chance that what you'll see is similar to what I'm about to talk about. So as we do this, ask yourself, what's going on here? That's an important question. And it's something that I hope you ask yourself as we work through all the questions this semester. Let's say that I wanted to illustrate two fifths. And let's say that I had five coins and that among those five coins, two of them were dimes. So let's make sure that that's the situation we're in. I see one, two, three, four, five coins, and I see two dimes. Every elementary school and even college text that introduces fractions falls into this situation. And you can see this in the text today. So this is, they would say, a model of two fifths. Two fifths of these coins are dimes. Now let's look at the second situation. Using that exact same uh, method, we could represent one-fifth as one dime, still we're counting dimes, among five coins. There it is, just the one dime among the five coins. So two-fifths, two of those dimes among five coins, uh, one-fifth, one dime among five coins. Now let's ask the next logical question. What happens when we combine both of these sets together? So let's make sure that we've done that. In the first set, we had two dimes. In the next one, we had a third. So there they are, three dimes. And then five coins and five more coins, a total of 10 coins. Let's make sure that's true as well. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 coins. So using that same definition, we'd say that we now have three dimes among 10 coins. In other words, using that same definition, we'd say that this is 3 tenths. We combined these two sets, so the question then becomes, does that mean that 2 fifths plus 1 fifth is 3 tenths? And the answer is absolutely and emphatically no. But you can also see that a rational person, when presented with these models of fractions, would say 
that two fifths plus one fifth was three dimes out of ten coins, three tenths. This does not work. The answer is not three tenths. Now, I'm not usually this direct in this course, but in this example, I want to point out that we can be in a situation where a pattern appears to lead one place, and that may not be a place that we want to go because this particular example of fractions does not work. You can't use open-ended sets like this to get to a model of adding or subtracting fractions. So I'm going to say again, this is not a good model of adding and subtracting fractions. And by extension, I would say that it's not a good model of fractions. Because what's the point of a model of fractions if you can't do something with it? If you can't do addition with it, for example. So hopefully this gives you a sense of what it means to be thoughtful about something as we work through it. What's going on here? Well, I think what's going on here is that as teachers, we sometimes fall into a trap of prevent presenting a simple reason for something that is more complicated or is not true in the setting that we're presenting. And I think you can say that about this. This is not a good model of fractions. It invites students to get the wrong answer. And I hope all of us would mark this answer wrong. But I hope that all of us would also see that many of our students could make this mistake for a very good reason. And that is they were presented with a model of fractions that didn't generalize. Okay, so I'm going to once again say that the attendance assessments are essential. That's the key of this uh, entire course. That's where it's Socratic. That's where we're learning by induction. And by extension, you're learning how mathematics can be conveyed in that way. Let's take a look at the syllabus and at MyOpenMath. Okay, here's the syllabus. And again, welcome. Um, we will successfully investigate mathematics. This course will give you the mathematical background to enjoy mathematics. And I really do hope that's true, especially for those who intend to teach it. Of course, it's open to all. You will gain the skills and techniques needed to continue your mathematical journey as well as um, your educational journey. So welcome. Um, this is mathematical discovery. It's transferable. I have morning office hours. It's three units. There's uh, my email and um, ethical conduct. Don't cheat. So this is basically a long-winded way of saying that. Cheating is submitting for credit the work of another as your own. And similarly, allowing someone else to submit your work as their own is also cheating. And bad things happen when you cheat. Worse, as a student, your goal is conceptual understanding. That allows you to solve problems in other settings. So when asked, you will be able to explain your reasoning in your own words and solve similar questions. I'm going to start this uh, part with a quote from Albert Einstein. How is it possible that mathematics, a product of human thought that is independent of experience, fits so excellently the objects of reality? That is an excellent question. And of course, Albert Einstein was a physicist, but he thought very deeply about mathematics. And so let's think about this idea of being independent of experience. If you do things and get a result, if you perform an experiment, that is called science. Mathematics is very different in that it is about human thought. And earlier I said that's one of the reasons that I feel that it is more like um, art than it is like science. It is about being able to express what it is to be human. But his question is very interesting in the sense that we do math and maybe a hundred years later, we discover that it explains a new phenomena that we found in nature. Albert Einstein, of course, finding all sorts of new things, laying the groundwork for um, uh, quantum mechanics and things that came um, uh, after him. But certainly using mathematics that had been around for a very long time, but had not, um, at, up to that point, been seen to explain what he called the objects of reality. So human thought, the real world, no experiments, but still mathematics is producing uh, a, way of us, a way for us to understand our universe. So an excellent quote. 
So it's great to have a computer with a screen and video capture. It makes, uh, makes it easier to ask questions, but you know, email is perfect and you will only be graded on what you do in MyOpenMath anyway. I'm old fashioned. I love seeing notes. So as I'm, as I'm working through this, I have notes. Um, paper and pencil notes are great. I would take notes on every part of the semester as we work through things. Remember, you've got two weeks, so you can gain ground by recording what you've got and those equations. You'll certainly need them later. Um, a calculator is not essential. Uh, it's very useful. I certainly have a calculator handy. I wouldn't recommend one in particular because I don't think there's anything um, particularly special about one versus another. All of our homework, that is the attendance assignments, but also the exams are in MyOpenMath. MyOpenMath is free. You can go in at any time. MyOpenMath itself was created by math teachers. Um, and then, of course, as I've said, the course itself was coded by me. Here's the course ID and the enrollment key. I've also sent you the login instructions. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so let's take a look inside of my open math. So let's go into the student side here. This is what you will see. So of course the field trip or the alternative, here are some class resources, um, some information about uh, me and what I've been up to, um, the syllabus and the uh, attributions and the um, uh, Creative Commons license. Here's a link to the video, some introductions, uh, so a way to get to know other folks in class. The um, class notes, so help everyone uh, to prepare for those exams, you can post in there. And then it looks like the first two weeks of the semester appear, so let's go into that first Wednesday's assignments. So here they are. The first thing is a playlist about uh, Socrates by Bethany Hughes. Um, I don't have any points due on that, but I think it's an excellent way to start the semester with a historical overview of what so the Socratic method is and the idea of um, democracy, the idea of debate and coming to a common understanding of something. Getting started is simply a way of um, learning how to enter answers into um, my open math. So you can use the keypad. So here I am simply entering an answer. And then I'm going to go to the second question here. The um, progress is saved as you work through it. You rarely have to save things, but if you're saving in the middle, you can do that as well. Um, and something new here. So here's how we would enter the square root of four in um, from the keypad, but we've also got math quill nowadays. So I'm going to go in and just click on the square root and five. Now if I keep typing, I'm inside the radical and I don't want to be inside the radical. I want to get out. So if I go to the right, I can escape the radical. I can put this into a fraction and it says there should be a two down there. And then I'll press enter to um, put that in. Um, this last one, a little bit more interesting. It looks like there's some exponents and grouping symbols. So I'm going to create a fraction. I'm going to put a one upstairs. To get downstairs, I'm going to use the down arrow key, putting in a two, my superscript for an exponent, and a three. And just like the radical, I'm still in the exponent. So if I keep typing, um, I'm still upstairs in that exponent. So if I go to the right, I can escape and say subtract three. So it looks like those are um, good as well. So basically, just um, entering answers into uh, my open math. So two and a half, I'm going to do this with the keyboard. So I'm pressing a two, then I'm pressing the space key on the keyboard, and then a one. So that's not 21, um, and it says it's not even a valid expression for anything at this point. I'm then going to use the slash on my keyboard. That gives me the fraction and a two, and I've entered the um, mixed numeral two and one half. Um, so just a, a nice way to get started. So we're entering a bunch of stuff. Um, so just make sure that you can enter these things correctly. And um, that's a useful place to start. Not that we'll be writing expressions that involve transcendental numbers and transcendental functions, but it is nice to be able to um, uh, enter stuff into MyOpenMath. 
Um, the next thing is a forum, so you can ask and answer questions. You can get extra credit. I look at the answers, I look at the questions, um, but I don't participate directly in the forums. This is for you. And then the attendance assignment itself. This is the first one. It's not intended to be difficult by any measure. Notice that there are just two questions here. I can jump around, so I could work a little bit on the first question and then um, leave, log out, go do something else, work on the second question, do the same. Here's our same question again. The brother of the chief executive officer, the CEO of a major industrial firm died. The man who died had no brother. How is this possible? So our first essay or, or short um, um, free response question. The words brother, CEO, and man. What do all of these words make you think? Uh, I don't know, something like that the CEO or that the um, CEO is, not SEO, a CEO is a man. I mean, all those words de definitely have a gender to them. And then I'd say next part, and it says, oh, that the CEO is a man. Let's consider the second sentence. The man who died had no brother. The man who died had no brother. Is he the CEO referred to in this question? So let's see, the CEO died. The man who died had no brother. But it was the brother of the CEO. So let's see, is the CEO the man who died? Who had no brother. Well, the brother of the CEO died. The man who died had no brother. Those are two different people. That's not the CEO. The man who died had no brother is not the CEO. So is it the same referred to? No. So the next part? Uh, nope. He is the brother of the CEO. Okay. And then who can have a brother? And you see how this goes. This says that there are seven parts. So this is a very, very short one. Um, a lot of free response here. And I can, I can leave this question, I can go to another question um, and start it. So this, this second question has 10 parts. Again, very short, uh, a gentle introduction for this introduction here, just asking you to um, step through some simpler questions. Notice that I've made it very clear that this starts with the inductive part, that bold and highlighted uh, word there. Now, um, I don't need to uh, save because it says that the progress has been saved. If I submit an end, that means I'm done and I want it graded, and I'm not, so I'm not going to press that. I'm just going to go back out and it says, oh, don't forget to come back. You haven't um, grade, you haven't finished yet. So that's a nice reminder. Um, and then, of course, two weeks are open, so that also means that the assignments due on August 31st are open. If you need a reminder of long division, here it is. You'll need that uh, later in some of these questions. Again, another forum. And then the prereq checker. So um, it says start, and we download a GeoGebra file, actually a, a, a LibreOffice file, and then we do what it says to do. So I guess we could do that. So let's, um, let's take a look at this. So this is the LibreOffice file. It says drag the blue square so that it covers the red square. Okie dokie. And then do some other things. So um, we'll save, you'd save it, and then you'd upload it. Um, and then the next part, oh, says I haven't done anything, is about um, GeoGebra. So let's go back to that assessment. Don't forget to come back. Um, let's go back to that assessment and see that the assessment will open as soon as the prerequisite check is completed. That's done manually by me. I do that sometime around 9. That's when I start. So if you've submitted it by 9 a.m., I should have it graded hopefully by noon or so. Um, the attendance assignment will then appear um, once I've got 100% on the prereq check. Here's a link to our first documentary, The Story of One. So let's see if when it takes me to the library I have to log in. Um, so that library site is loading and there it is, The Story of One, How a Single Digit Created Math and Changed the World. So I'm going to see if I can watch it. And it says that I need to log in, so I guess I'll do that. And um, let's make sure that this will play here. So I'm just waiting for uh, the video to load um, as it's streaming from our library. So all the documentaries are free. You can watch them in exactly this way once, <laughs> once they choose to load. OK, so here we go. Um, and let's get started. And 
um, see what So there's a, a little clip from our video, our first documentary, The Story of One. So let's go back to the um, syllabus. So we were in My Open Math. Let's go back to My Open Math. And um, there's, uh, for the first documentary, there's a sample exam. So everyone will see the same uh, 10 questions for this one. But it gives you a sense of what 10 questions in 20 minutes feels like. So again, watch it three times. First time just to get the content, what it's about. Um, watch it with friends. Watch it with the purpose of enjoying it. Second time, take notes. Pause. Third time, make sure that those notes are good. And then we have uh, the graded exam. So 10 questions in 20 minutes. The next time you'll see this in the next week's assignment, you'll have um, the second attempt. Remember, it's the average of all of those uh, documentary exams. So that's um, what's in My Open Math. That's how it will feel. There's also exams in there as well. Um, so uh, there's the login instructions, uh, a link to GeoGebra if you want to install it on your machine, um, and a link to download LibreOffice. It's free. It runs on uh, Linux machines, Macs, and of course um, um, IBM clones. Here's the links to all of our documentaries. There's also links inside of um, my open math. Uh, another note about discovery. Our objective in this course is discovery in the context of arithmetic, algebra, and geometry. The focus on discovery makes this course dis different from almost all others. This class is not deductive, where your professor provides a formula that you will apply to the exercise set. No part of this class will be plug and chug. This class is instead inductive. You will look through many examples for patterns. Then you will form a conjecture. That's a, a good guess. Finally, you'll either prove the conjecture, making it a theorem, or disprove it using a counterexample. We'll, we'll do that for some of the number theory questions. Those are questions about evenness and odds, things like that. This course will develop your critical thinking and reasoning skills. Participation is critical. I'm sure you can see that. It basically uh, steps you through it the way we would in class. In this course, the answer is much less important than the process of searching for patterns and discovering results. We do not use a book. Your professor cannot provide a theorem to you. Instead, your professor will ask a series of questions in the attendance assignments. So the attendance assignments are Socratic, so uh, teaching by asking questions. I really recommend, and I cannot overstate this, begin each assignment as soon as it opens. So you've got two weeks for a reason. So every week you should be starting new assignments. Every week you should be starting those assignments with that are two weeks away in terms of when they're due. Explore each topic uh, requires you to search for patterns. This requires time to explore and form conjectures. Sometimes the, the next question will be, what is your conjecture? So you may be, um, the only way through this may be if you've given yourself the time to say, OK, I need to go and think and look through your notes and look through the examples you've seen and start to form a conjecture. And that may be in the middle of a problem. So be sure you've got plenty of time. Critically examine the questions and the patterns that you find. Critically examine. So just because we found a pattern doesn't mean that it's necessarily a very good one. If you have a model of fractions that uses coins, you may get to a place that you don't want to be. That's what critically examine means. Take notes as you work through the assignments. That is essential. That is part of what a college level course is. Now taking those notes means that you can use our results in a different setting. 
It also means that you can use that same kind of procedure in a different setting. And make sure that you can explain each step to yourself so that you can relearn the procedure. You know, you'll see them again on the exams in the final. Um, you've got to complete those attendance assignments on time. That's a course requirement. And just like any attendance assignment, if you fail two or more attendance assignments, that is, you fail to complete them, you'll be dropped from the course. Now, there's two parts to the exam. There is inductive parts, and even on the exams, the inductive portion is not timed. So when I say exams are timed, that's referring to the deductive portion of the exams. So there are, even on the exams, a very clear distinction between the inductive portion of the course, where you're looking at patterns, that will be untimed. But I want to also point out that there will be some timed components. In other words, there's two separate assignments when you get to see the exams. One will say inductive, it will have a due date, but it will not be timed. One will say deductive, and it will be timed. In other words, you, you'll have two hours to work through those. So again, your notes are essential for that. Um, and then I've learned uh, to say what I hope is obvious. Exams which are missed will earn no points. Uh, grades are assigned in the traditional manner. Let's look at the uh, weights. Um, the exams and the attendance assignments are both 35%. So 70% uh, um, of your uh, course grade comes from those two things. Remember, all the attendance assignments are open for two weeks. And remember that the deductive exams are the only ones that are timed. And those use results that you have already gotten and are in your notes from the attendance assignments. So assuming you're taking good notes, you'll be fine with those. The documentaries are worth a quarter of the course, so 1.4 or 25% for those documentary exams. And remember, those are serving uh, four different and valuable purposes to us over the course of the semester. And finally, 5% for the field trips. And if you're seeing that and you're thinking, well, you're not going to be able to do that, well, stay tuned. We'll talk about how to get through that. Another quote. Despite an objectivity that has no parallel in the world of art, the motivation and standards of creative mathematics are more like those of art than of science. Lynn Steen was the president of the American Mathematical Association, and hopefully uh, by the end of the semester you get a sense of what she means. Um, each documentary will consist of two parts. The first part will be timed, the second will not. All documentaries exams close on the Wednesday due date. And you saw those uh, first two, two due dates uh, when we logged into MyOpenMath. All the due dates are on Wednesdays. Some of you might have time on the weekends uh, to work, but there's, there's no guarantee of when you've got time. This is an asynchronous course, so Wednesday seems as good a time as any. It allows a, a little buffer before and after. Make sure to configure your college email. That's um, my primary method of getting in touch with you if I can't um, uh, uh, send you a message in my open math or if you're not getting mine or I'm not getting yours. So make sure that that line of communication is open. In an online asynchronous course, uh, we are interacting with our classmates um, through the forums, through the class notes. And I think online, more than anywhere else, being respectful and being courteous is essential. So, of course, any disparaging terms cannot be used. And your fellow students are here for the same reason you are, to learn. Um, there may be times that are frustrating to them. Be respectful of their feelings and how they're doing. And a lot of help will come from your fellow students. Thank them for that. Um, that's one of the, the few times that I can give extra credit to a, a person posing a problem is when they thank the people answering it at the end. Some dates to remember. We've got some holidays, although not nearly as much as the spring semester. We've got some drop deadlines. September 4th is the last uh, day to drop without um, notation or to enroll. Um, and then uh, November 15th to drop with a W. 
And then I, I put this down even though it's next year, but it'll be close by the time December runs around, and that is to get those Cal Grant applications in. This course also has field trips. If you're going into teaching, this can be one of the most uh, challenging and rewarding parts of teaching, is running field trips. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to do this. I'm going to um, also email you the um, uh, sheet to excuse your absence on these three dates. Because it's asynchronous, you do not have to go on these dates. Um, you can go any time. I'm perfectly fine with that, assuming that you can get the reports in before December 1st. So any one of these satisfies or can satisfy if you do a thorough job. Any one of these visits um, is sufficient for that 5% for the field trips. 5% not because field trips don't take that much work. They take a fair amount of work. They take a fair amount of effort. And, you know, all these places um, have uh, entry fees. So there's that to consider as well. But it's just essential to see for yourself and to experience for yourself learning mathematics in a non-formal setting. Um, we often assume that science museums are for kids, and certainly that's how they're marketed, and certainly when you're a teacher you'll be bringing kids to them. But we can learn a lot of mathematics and science by going to these things as well. It's, it's really fascinating when you're kind of waiting for your chance to play around with an exhibit, like at the Exploratorium, and watch a bunch of kids almost get to an idea, and then rush off. But you know, hopefully they'll be back. And just that idea of looking for a pattern, that in itself is valuable. So the Exploratorium is in San Francisco. It's along the waterfront. Um, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a fairly short walk from the BART station at Embarcadero. There's also the F streetcar line that goes there. Lawrence Hall of Science is in the Berkeley Hills. It has a beautiful view over the bay. You can see the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate. You can see all of Berkeley and Oakland. And then, of course, the Museum of Science and Curiosity is here in Sacramento. Um, and if that is not something that uh, works for you, there are definitely alternatives. I have that set and waiting for you in my open math. So if the pandemic is an issue for you, if cost is an issue for you, I understand completely. And I have, uh, there is no problem at all. There is no um, difficulty with doing any of the alternatives. There's, um, it's, it's, it's not even intended to be that difficult. I would much prefer to get a photo essay from you um, with a little description. There's uh, another PDF that I've sent out for, for completing that. I think you'll really enjoy it. I think it'll empower your desire to become a teacher to go on a field trip. But I also know that in this world, that may not be something that you can do yet. Um, if you want to get in touch with me to um, figure out how to use transit and um, Amtrak to get down to the Exploratorium in Lawrence Hall, get in touch with me. I can, I can help you out with that. Um, and then just downtown here in Sacramento is the Museum of Science and Curiosity. So the quote on this uh, page, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Well, that is math 310 in one sentence, to teach uh, one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. And learning mathematics from the ground up is a great way to get there. So a fantastic quote from the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Here are our outcomes. So we're going to explore and discover uh, fairly vague words. Um, so we're looking for patterns and relations. So number theory, statistics, geometry. We're going to formulate conjectures. Those are the guesses, the good guesses that we make when we look at patterns. And again, from a different uh, set of places, we're going to prove and find counterexamples to our proposed conjectures. We'll mainly do this in the context of number theories. Um, look at some data and calculate some probabilities. The Learning Resource Center is a free uh, resource for you. They've got online tutoring. And of course, if anything needs to change, I'll get in touch with you. Um, my office is in Howard Hall, not where this arrow is pointed. I'm actually closer to where the H is. I can look out and see the number one bus stop. Um, so that is where my office is um, when we're not in pandemic times. And I'm going to end this part with a um, quote 
So this is a photo I took up in uh, Twin Peaks, uh, walking the trail up um, from the bus stop at, uh, to Twin Peaks. Um, really, really volcanic, rocky, rocky outcropping with this beautiful plant on it. The pursuit of excellence in the face of adversity is invariably matched by the glory of the result. You know, I know that you're not a math student. I know you're not going into necessarily science. Um, you're going into teaching elementary school mathematics and nothing could be more valuable. So you may feel like you are in the face of adversity right now. Um, you may feel like uh, another math class, uh, a very different math class, um, with a whole different set of expectations. That is a place to really expect the results to be glorious. Okay, let's look at the schedule. Um, so there are assignments due on the first Wednesday of the semester, and of course, get started on that uh, first assessment as well. We've got some holidays sprinkled around here and there. Remember, you have a, a sheet that excuses you to go on the field trips, and here are the dates for those um, dates, but you can go any time. So many people say, well, a weekend would be better, then you can take your relatives and, and, and get some kids from your family or and, and go and have some fun. That's perfect, too. That is absolutely great. I just don't want this um, uh, to be something that cuts into time uh, for other things. So enjoy that. Here's our first exam on October 12th. We've got another exam and then, of course, the final. The um, uh, reports for the field trips are a separate thing. That's at the top of My Open Math. Or the um, alternative, which is walk, watching another documentary. That's also in there. I didn't have room to put in where we first see each of our documentaries, but here they are. You'll see it, of course, in My Open Math. So when you click on that days or the assignments that are due two weeks in the future, you can see what's due there as well. And I'll end with this quote um, from uh, Donald O'Shea. Artists and humanists embrace complexity and ambiguity. Mathematicians, in contrast, work by obsessively defining terms and stripping off extraneous meaning. The almost neurotic insistence that every term be rigorously defined and every statement proved ultimately frees one to imagine and talk about the unimaginable. Most people, traumatized by school experiences of mathematics, know all too well that mathematics is the most meticulous and demanding of disciplines but few get to see that it is also one of the most liberating and imaginative of all human activities. Absolute precision buys the freedom to dream meaningfully. What a wonderful quote. What a wonderful way of really putting in context what you'll be doing this semester. T just take that as a, 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 a two-word summary. Dream meaningfully. Get in touch with me if you've got any questions. You should also have some other PDFs. Uh, I mentioned the login instructions. If you're in My Open Math already, you don't need them. You can use the information in the syllabus, um, but I've also got that. And then if you do need um, to be excused from another course because you can't do the um, field trips any other time, get in touch with me for that 